everyone, welcome. Welcome to Woolen Spinning. My name is Rachel. Uh, it is Saturday, November 28th of 2020, and I want to welcome you to this place. Welcome to new viewers of the show. Thank you so much for checking out this space, and to returning viewers, thank you for continuing to watch and to come back here week after week. I really appreciate it. And thank you especially to uh, our Patreon community who supports the work here week in, week out, and supports the work in various ways through supporting online digital content that they are able to download throughout the month, as well as the audio podcast and a lot more. So thank you. If you guys don't mind just hitting the subscribe button and the like button, that would be wonderful. And can you believe it? We are already at 178, episode 178. We're 22 away from 200. I, I It just boggles my mind. <laughs> I am boggled. How is everybody? Um, James and uh, Mike just left and as they were going out the front door, um, our Christmas cards were delivered. So aren't those fun? I thought I would share them with you. So we normally don't do um, printed Christmas cards with video, with photos and whatnot, but our family mostly lives back east in Ontario. And uh, the we haven't seen anybody. We were supposed to go this year for Christmas, but of course, you know, best laid plans for 2020 and all of that. And um, so we decided to do a Christmas card this year with photos on it, not just a plain Christmas card. So um, yeah, really fun. The envelopes came and we'll get that into the into the mail. So we worked on those the other night, me and Mike, and um, I think they turned out really well. They're, two of the photos are actually from when we were in Tumblr Ridge, and then the other one is of James just a couple weeks ago. Because he has changed so much this fall. Um, it's just been unbelievable. Like the boy that we took with us to Tumblr Ridge, which is in northern British Columbia here in Canada, uh, and who we have now is just unbelievable. And part of it is that he really wanted to have a certain haircut, I'll show it to you again, um, that just makes him look older. His hair is all tousled there and it's not combed properly, but he just, uh, when it is done and when it is styled, it really makes him look like a nine year old and he is eight and a half. So yeah, it just, we wanted to have a really current photo. So yesterday was really challenging. Um, we had a wonderful live stream yesterday morning for the, for the wool circle, which is a live stream that happens twice a month for certain patrons of the community. We had a lot of fun. The kids were off of school yesterday and we headed over to my mom's cause she's within our bubble. She's in our household because she's on her own. And, um, I don't know what it was, but by about 11 o'clock in the morning, 1130, I was done with the two of them. And by 10 o'clock last night, the day had kind of, <laughs> so just a really frustrating day. And I got home, uh, the groceries were delayed. They called and asked if we could pick them up later. And so I didn't get home until 9 PM, which on a Friday night, it's no, no fun. And it was pouring rain. They had said it wouldn't rain. Anyways, all these things conspired. And uh, I said to Mike, I'm just, I need to have a good night's sleep. And I'm really excited to sit down with the community tomorrow and just have a chat. So here we are. And I just want to thank you guys for being here. So everybody is chit chatting away and I'm not going to try to scroll back because I did read a bunch of it because I know it had started before the live stream had started. So um, good morning to everybody who's here. Thank you so much for your participation already. We don't have a really super stacked show, but I think we'll just kind of take our time and work our way through it. We don't have a virtual spin group after uh, the podcast today. So we have a couple of extra minutes, which is kind of nice. A little bit of housekeeping because I haven't gone through it very much in the recent uh, couple of weeks. I've just referred you all to the show notes, which I will link in the live chat for you guys so that you can just click there if you're watching the live chat replay later. Uh, if you would like to subscribe to the newsletter, uh, it is available at wellforpearls.com. It comes out once a month and just has all of the links of all of the things that we're working on here at Wool and Spinning. Uh, all of the books that I've written and co-written with uh, Katrina Stewart of Crafty Jacks are linked in the show notes. And then we have a few alongs that we've been working on in our community, mostly just to come together and make together in this really strange time that we find ourselves in. So the first one is our natural shades along. This is celebrating natural shades of fiber. I wanted to make it really clear that this does not have to be natural shades of wool. It can be natural shades of cotton. It can be natural shades of plant-based hemp fiber. Some of the 
or of fast fibers. Some of the like hemp fibers, thistle, um, you guys help me out. Some of the different types of flax, toe flax, line flax, um, dew redded versus wet redded. You can get some amazing natural shades of some of those fibers. And uh, there's also, of course, all of the camelids, the different colors of alpaca, the different colors of llama, um, you know, some of the different colors of camel. There's not just camel colored for camel fiber. Um, yeah, so think outside the box for your natural shades along. Don't, don't, uh, we're not just looking at wool. For one of my natural shades along projects, I'm actually combining natural colors of silk, all the different wild silks, together with natural shades of wool. So that's just something to think about. Um, yeah, exactly, Diane, you and I were on the same wavelength there. So yeah, silk cotton, says Eve, absolutely. Um, our tin can knits along is also continuing on in the Ravelry group as well as the hashtag sweater spin channel on Slack for patrons. The um, tin can knits along is for us to have a chance to just knit up some really great patterns. Many of us have tin can knits patterns on our needles and we it was just an opportunity to come together and share those together because a lot of uh, tin can knits patterns are often used for gifts at this time of year. Quite a few people are knitting for others and we've shared a lot of that here on the podcast. So do jump in with our tin can knits along. And then our 51 yarns spin along for group A and group B. So group A is finishing up next month in December. Their two year spin along is going to be finishing. And group B is just finishing their first year and will be entering their second year in January, which is really amazing. You guys have done an amazing job. Those who've kept up with the spinning, really well done. It's a huge amount to work through that book and I really commend you. So group A is gonna be finishing up next month and group B has one more year, which is awesome. And then our last sort of thing that we do together as a community is our book club. So book club is for Slack uh, channel members and patrons of the community. It's under the hashtag books, books, books channel and we are currently reading Northanger Abbey. We also have our anti-racism book club and that meets monthly and we're actually meeting on Wednesday. So hopefully um, those who are interested in that work are able to come to that. And you just need to be in the books, books, books channel uh, to be able to participate in that. So let's get into the show. noticed but as the credits rolled by one of the things about the gentle morning that I loved and making uh, was some of the little de attention to detail that she included in the pattern and I don't know if you guys noticed but at the bottom at the hem where the faux rib uh, meets the cast off edge there the cast off edge creates just a gorgeous braid at the bottom because of how it all sits and every time that photo scrolls by on our stream for the credits, I look at it and I just, I love it. <laughs> it's just this perfect braid at the bottom. So next time when you guys are watching, you can watch out for that. So I have a couple of finished things to share with you. And uh, the first thing is actually something that I cast on after the show last week and I was inspired by Marjorie's project. So let's talk about that first. It's the headband with a twist. This is a free pattern by Morella Moments and this was from my, let me just change the cameras here to give me my, more room. This was my Halloween Rolex, the blended one that I had spun up. And so there's the blended Rolex from Halloween that I did and then the self-striping ones. And I had about, I'm not exactly sure how many grams of each I had for the, I should weigh this actually. But after seeing uh, Marjorie's project uh, last weekend and she worked up all of her yarns from our breeding color study and we talked about it for a while and she had shared it 
and I shared it here on the podcast, I thought, what a cool idea, because I was making the Montana Mountain Cowl, which is by a pattern by Andrea Mowry, and I was just kind of bogged down with it, and it's a mosaic pattern. I will make it eventually, but with a different yarn. Um, there was a, there's a lot of knitting in it, which is totally fine, but with everything that's going on here and work and the podcast and some stuff that I'm working on for the new year, which we'll talk about a little bit later on, I just needed a mindless kind of frou-frou knit, if you will. So I whipped off the, uh, cowl. So this is called headband with a twist. It's brioche. And it is simple, simple, simple. And I'll see if I can put it on without completely messing up my hair. How cute is that? I'll turn like I'm in love. <laughs> I think it is so fun. So I'm going to do the same with my, let me just get my bangs out of my eyes. Um, sorry, the, uh, I'm going to do the same with the other skein as well. And then we'll be able to kind of compare and contrast them and see the difference. But this is the twist up here. It's right here. Isn't that fun? So basically what you do is you cast on a certain number of stitches. Uh, it's a free pattern. So I think you cast on like 30 stitches or whatever. And then for the first row, the setup row for brioche, you, you, um, decrease a certain number of stitches and, uh, to, to start the brioche, to set it up basically. And after you have set it up and cast it on, you knit, uh, I think it's 19 inches or 19 and a half inches or whatever. I was right around there. My head's not really super big. I find 22 inch hats sometimes are actually a little bit too big for me. So I do tend to make my hat brims more like 21 inches around. And then I find they're just a little bit more snug. You would think with all of my hair that I would need that ex extra width around the brim, but I find with my hair, because my hair is quite silky, it's not coarse, um, stuff slips on my hair. So I knit to about 18, 18 and a half inches ish. Uh, and Nora was so in love with it too, that she would kept playing with it and I would be knitting on it and she'd be playing with the other end and oh mommy, I really like this. And you know, like she does. And so, um, you cast off at the end and then you put the two ends together, you kind of scissor them together and you add a twist and then you sew those four edges together. So you fold the, the band in half and you, you um, lay it out so that you folded it in half and then you take those two ends and you place them together um, in kind of like a sandwich and then you sew them together and, and you twist in the meantime and that's what creates this lovely twist. Isn't that fun? And it's so simple. Yeah, it's way more simple than the cal calimetry, calorimetry. How, how do you say that? That was one of those patterns that was really, really popular when uh, Ravelry first started, first got started. And it just creates this lovely detail. I was really, really, um, when, I, when I was making it, I actually was a little bit torn about whether or not the twist, like this, this part here, would actually lay flat or would, would kind of, when you when you first turn it right side out because it looks like this when you finish it so it's folded in half let me actually show you so it's folded in half like this and you twist it like a mobius and then you sew it all together and then you turn it right side out and when you first turn it i actually this was all really really sticking up and it was really um it wasn't sitting properly and I was really worried that it wasn't going to sit nicely because you do have quite a big seam back here. Anyways, it took Nora mm, maybe five minutes of wearing it for it all to lay down and for it all to look really natural and really kind of normal. And um, yeah, it's just a super simple pattern and really, really fun to make. So I'm going to bring this up close just so that you can see the texture um, in this because the yarn had thread in it. It had... Uh, sorry silk it had um sparkle and you can see it all in the knitted stitch and because the brioche gives it a chance to kind of show off um it gives it an opportunity to sort of be shown in those brioche stitches and not be completely completely hidden and so there's sparkle in there firestar angelina there's some sorry silk some thread uh, it might actually be better for me to show you on this camera because the other camera is blowing out because of the lights, but you can see all of that texture in there. It's just really fun and it's very, it's Halloweeny. Like the colors are definitely Halloweeny. Um, 
but I don't know. I think it's really fun. I'd really like to make one for Christmas now. <laughs> I think it would be really fun to make one, make a Halloween blended one for, for Christmas because I think it's just, it's so wearable, right? And Nora had it on. Let me completely mess up my hair here. Um, we have family photos after this, so I'm trying to keep my hair relatively intact. Um, Nora had was wearing it like this. Um, I trimmed my my bangs this week and they're just a little bit fly away. Um, so Nora was walking around the house wearing it like this and I think this would be really cute if you tied your hair up and you kind of had it like that. It's really cute like that. And, um, and then you can make sure that it stays over your ears. Kind of makes me think of those uh, ads from the 1950s, um, the arm and hammer, you know, the of the woman. Anyways, really, really fun. Everybody should make one. Super, super fun pattern. Thank you so much, Marjorie, for um, recommending it and for posting about it because I never would have known. Yeah, it's total 1920s style, isn't it? Yeah, you nailed it, um, Kirsten. Yeah, really fun. So that was a great pattern, great project. And you get some photos this afternoon. It was just really, really, really fun to make. It took me probably about three hours of knitting from start to finish because I kept being interrupted. It was really, really easy. And definitely, definitely, definitely um, just grab some, some hand spun from your stash that's like a DK. And if it's fingering, hold it double. Didn't take much yarn at all. And it was just really, really, really fun. Oh, you guys are so funny. Um, you're talking about um, uh, pronouncing calorimetry. It's funny because I took a bunch of chemistry at um, uh, university as well. For I did them as my... Um, electives in nursing and I still I like drug names I struggle with I just struggle to pronounce things once I have it I have it um but just getting my mouth around some of the pronunciation it's uh so I really appreciate you guys helping me <laughs> um the pattern calls the stitch English rib yeah they call it it's just brioche yeah absolutely exactly Marjorie um it's funny because that actually segues thank you Marjorie because that actually segues into my next project about brioche that I was going to talk about um this is the black forest cardigan and this is a pattern by um Verena Coors and this is in the woods publication um and this was the pat the the sweater that I talked about last week that I ripped out that I um had ripped out my fireside and um had pivoted, uh, had washed all of the yarn. I skeined it all up. This is this. These are some of the dried skeins. I spun this um, long draw. I uh, did it during Spinzilla a few years ago, and um, I ripped out and and I knit up the fireside, and it just does. It just didn't fit me, so I never wore it. It sat in a sealed Ziploc bag for basically since I made it talked about that quite a bit last week on the podcast so we won't go into it uh in great detail this time around I had dyed this with a uh, black walnut um and it was a gorgeous gray CVM meat merino uh Suffolk uh cross it was off of a ram's fleece that had been pin drafted at Carstairs at Custom Wool and Mills in Carstairs, Alberta. And it was a very rough, toothy wool. It's still rough and toothy. There's nothing that hasn't changed. And um, sometimes when I say it was, then I'm thinking maybe they think that it's not that way anymore. But it usually, wool doesn't really change. <laughs> so I um, ripped it all out, washed it, reskeined it. I have about a thousand, about 1100 yards of this yarn and I started knitting the black forest cardigan. Now this, after knitting on it for about an inch, after I cast on the stitches and had started it and started again going, I realized that this fisherman rib that she was, had written out in the pattern, the fisherman's rib, it's just brioche as well. It's just written in a different way and explained in a different way so that you can work the increases um, and so that you can... Uh, you know, sort of make the increases look like part of the brioche, but it's just brioche. Um, I think with some of these patterns that were published a while ago, it was kind of before brioche was like a thing. Um, but the the yarn overs on the right side and the wrong side, that's all just kind of a, a, a hybrid brioche stitch. So this is really hurting my wrist because the yarn is so, it's quite stiff. Um, it's not a... It's not a soft, gentle wool. It's not a, 
I don't know what the right word would be, but it like it's not a um, it's a bit toothy. It's it's sort of a bit uh, dense. Not in a how do I explain it? It's not flexible. <laughs> like it's not it's not um maybe you guys can help me out with some words. It's springy and it's got a nice uh, bounce and elasticity to it. It's got um, the the knitted fabric is really quite lovely, but it's not a forgiving wool. And when you're knitting with it, it's I feel it in my hands every single stitch. So the way that the pattern is written, she wants you to knit into the stitch below so that the stitch basically falls down and is held um by the stitch below which is a, like i said it's kind of a glorified brioche it's just a different way of doing brioche um and it's called fisherman's rib and it's just too hard on my hand because you're kind of digging around with the needle to get into those lower stitches so i ripped it all out and i've redone it and i'm actually knitting it in brioche so i've got those yarn overs i don't know if you can see this is the right side here there's those yarn overs on the needle here and here and they go all the way along and it means that I have to be a little bit more careful with the increases and how I lift up and where I lift up from but so far it's actually looking quite quite nice and it looks like it's sort of as written and it's creating a really nice raglan uh, because you have these two stitches flanked by a rib stitch in between to keep the the look of the rib through the raglan um, it keeps it sort of intact and looking the way that it should in the pattern. So I'm just kind of Frankensteining it a little bit to compensate for my for my wrist because there's no way that I can knit this entire pattern. And I don't actually think that I could knit this yarn in uh, stockinette stitch either. Like, you know, knitting in the round or uh, knit, knitting and purling. Like I think a textured stitch works the best to help this to work up, but it definitely, I can only do a few rounds and then I, or a few rows and then I need to put it down. The nice thing about kind of uh, fiddling around with the stitches is that I can still follow the pattern and do everything that she's telling me to do uh, because it's a really well-written pattern, just like Sevo Boulin, which is also from the Woods publication, but um, I just, it's a bit easier on my hand, so yeah. Oh, did you, Mars? Yeah, and you posted about those those toques. They were just uh, brilliant. Had some wrist and thumb pain from ribbing on four hats. Yeah. Yeah, I agree, Eva. I think there's lots of different ways to write out the instructions for brioche, and it's called different things in different places, but there's no difference in the actual fabric. So really, it's a matter of finding what works for you. Like, I've noticed um, in a couple of the uh, Stephen West patterns that I've written, he's explained it in different ways, in different patterns, but it's the same aesthetic. It's the same stitch, the same fabric that's created. So the nice thing is if you know that, then you can knit it the way that works the best for you, which is really nice. So, oh, have fun skiing, gorgeous. Enjoy. Um, so that is that pattern. So those are my brioche, my brioche pattern uh, projects. I don't knit brioche very often. And uh, it's funny that sort of all of a sudden I've ended up with a couple of brioche on the needles because I really enjoy it. I like the aesthetic that it creates. I like the rib that it creates. And I just haven't done brioche for a long time. So I wanted to talk a little bit about my Endel because I never really gave it uh, an opportunity to shine on the podcast, if you will. And uh, this was a test knit that I did for my friend Kelly G Knits. I'll put this under the product camera, actually, so you can really see it. So this is Endel uh, by Kelly G Knits. This is a um, test knit that I did for her a few weeks ago. It's a two color, uh, color work toque. You start at the brim and you cast on in your main color. And this is all I have left of the palette. I started off with 37 grams of the Knit Picks palette in white. It was from my stash and I have about four grams left. So I took just over 30 grams of yarn and this is knit on two point, maybe Kelly, you can help me, uh, 2.75 millimeter needles, I think. I held it with my, the second color that I used was my uh, BFL on the round uh, that I've had in my stash and spun up for quite a long time. And I've talked about it on the podcast, so I'm going to put it with this and I'm going to do this pattern and I'm going to do this and I never do. 
so I did it with this. I still have a ton of the yarn left, but it really made me realize I need to knit with this uh, yarn because it's just gorgeous and it knit up beautifully. I was a little bit concerned as I got to this section in here because the white was really matching up and and of course the color was really fading on the on the BFL and I, we got into this sort of camel color in here with this gorgeous sage green and it was getting lighter and lighter and lighter and I almost broke my yarn and pulled back on that section so that the color would move into the darker colors again up here in the so these would have ended up down lower but I'm actually really glad that I didn't because it actually is a more natural progression of color I think if I had broken the color down here and switched you you would have lost this gradation and this sort of ombre effect so I'm glad that I didn't um the hat itself fits beautifully let me find the brim the back of it I'm going to pull my bangs out of the way actually so this is how I wear that I actually wore this toque this week that's why I wanted to uh, share it with you guys so that I could um continue to wear it without worrying about whether or not it looked blocked or not so what I do when I'm wearing toques is I pin my hair up because I have so much hair it's just unbelievable I am thankful for it but it does it is a lot this is how I wear these toques So that is it. Isn't that pretty? Whoa. Knocking things over. <laughs> I'll put it on the big camera for a minute. So this is that too. So with a big um with a big shawl on, um, I was wearing it this week and I got so, so many compliments on it. Um it was really, really quite lovely. And um, you can see how the brim stretches out a little bit from from that two color, two color ribbing. And uh, that's actually what in uh, endeared me to knitting this tube was was the brim I just thought the brim was fantastic and then look at the crown so hopefully you guys can see that there I can't see obviously but the brim the the crown just the the decreases they just make my heart sing so that is that so I've worn it once already and uh yeah, I agree, Elizabeth. Um, the light color hits a very nice place when wearing it. I agree. I think if it had been down low in the ribbing, uh, down here, if this section had been down here, it would have you would have really lost all of this in here, and you wouldn't have been able to really see uh, the gorgeous gradation of color in here. And I think it would it there would have really been something lost in the hand spun down here because really a pattern like this, if you're knitting it in hand spun, is to showcase the hand spun, right? Like that's the whole point. And, um, you know, to have this kind of texture, uh, uh, to have this kind of color work and the drape and just the overall aesthetic of the toque, to have that down here in the brim for that amount of work on 2.75 millimeter needles, uh, which is a U.S. size, is that a U.S. size 2? I'm trying to remember. Um, so whereas instead it's up here and so by then your eye has created the pattern and your eye continues to see the pattern even though it is lighter in here. So it's really actually quite brilliant when you th how the color ended up working up. Um, 2.75 millimeter needles is US size 2 and the brim, the ribbing, uh, is actually on 2.75. 2.5 millimeter needles. So I actually worked these this toque because of the small needle size. I actually worked this toque on my chow goose uh, because they're quite pointy, and I used my smallest cable that I had so that I could work in the round. Um, and I yeah, it, it worked out really well to have those really super pointy needles and to be able to work my way through. So that is that. I never really got to like wax poetic about it. So I wanted to give it the uh, opportunity and the chance that it deserved, especially because it was a crap ton of work. <laughs> so I feel like I just, it needs to, it's moment to shine. And you guys need to be able to see it on. Because actually I still don't have any photos of it, which is kind of weird. Um, because normally I do take photos of stuff as I'm making it and whatnot, but I whipped this off so fast. Uh, I worked at, I was working on it at tutoring while I was waiting at tutoring because, um, 
James has a total of an hour and a half of tutoring a week, and then there's three hours of waiting at soccer. And because of the new regulations and stipulations, they've asked that parents stay in their vehicles. And so, and they just text us if the if your child needs something, needs to go to the bathroom or needs to whatever, needs help with their shoes. And so um, I've ended up with basically over five hours of knitting time, just sitting, waiting for the kids in the evening. So. Um, in some ways I'm really lucky, but it's also a lot of sitting. So I'm very aware of sort of that, that catch 22, if you will. I thought what we could talk about next was a, a sweater that I had cast on. Oh, let's talk about Nora's sweater. I finished it. The last unicorn, the last unicorn sweater. It is done. Ba, 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 ba. So this is let Lopi. It is not washed. It fits her. I ripped it out and re-knit it, but look at how big it is. Um, it has ended up, it, it, she's a 26 inch bust, 25 and a half and 26 with a t-shirt on. And, um, I'm, I can't believe how much she is growing. It is just unbelievable. So this is a pattern. It's called the last unicorn sweater by Megan Reagan. And, um, I did this in let Lopi for her original in the original pattern. There's a rainbow up here and there's also, uh, the pattern includes a chart for hearts and it also includes a chart for I think it's stars for stars. Um, I, when I ripped this out and re knit it because it was so big. So I had cast on for the 28 inch bust size and it would have fit me even though I had gauge. Um, the stitch counts were just unbelievable. Um, like they were, they were sort of out of sync, even though I had gauge, it was just obviously out of sync for the size that I needed to knit for Nora. Um, I ripped it back and I ended up making the 24 inch bust, but this still worked up to be about a 27 inch bust. So it is too big for her obviously, but it's wearable and it gives her a little bit of ease to be able to have a long sleeve shirt underneath. When she tried this on last night, she did not complain about the scratchiness or the itchiness of the wool at all. Um, but she had a long sleeve t-shirt on underneath. So I'm going to get some photos of it today for her. And because of having to resize it and having to rip it out and redo everything, I skipped all of the charts. So adding the extra purple chart, uh, cause I had bought some purple to do that. I just skipped it all because there's just not enough room on the sweater um, to add all that extra stuff. I did add at the cuffs and the hems a little bit of color work down here at the bottom. So three rows of just sort of a staggered, a staggered sprinkling, if you will. And I did the same at the bottom of the sweater here, just to add a little bit of interest before I did the ribbing and cast off. So this was knit on 4.5 millimeter needles. The ribbing was done on four millimeter needles and I cast off and cast on at the top and cast off at the bottom with the larger needles. Um, just to give Nora some added room, um, taking it on and taking it off and it's created a nice stretchy bind off without flaring. Um, so overall, I'm really happy with the finished project. I put in one of my labels already for her so that she would know which was the back when she's putting it on in the morning. And um, yeah, it was a little bit of a labor of love. I'm not going to lie. Um, the sizing and whatnot was uh, very frustrating, but uh, I'll put it on the bigger camera so that you guys can see it. See the, the unicorns, but I'm glad it's done and she's really happy with it. And I think I'm going to let her just have it and wear it because she's excited about it now. And Christmas is a whole month away and you know how kids are. It's a novelty right now, but it might not be a novelty in a, another four weeks. So especially with everything that's happening and everything that's going on, I think if she wants to wear it now, she can. Yeah, it's super cute. Yeah, the labels are great. They're from Sweet Pine Hill in Alberta. Um, you can do them custom and they make you a whole batch and I so far haven't had to order any more. I still have probably about two dozen left. Um, the nice thing about them is they're, they're faux suede and I fold them and they have care instructions on the back. So hand wash, lay flat to dry, wellforpearls.com. So for gifts, they are wonderful. And also just for like when you're finishing up sweaters, I think when you're, you know, when you're holding it up and you're showing it and it's got a label in it, I think it just adds to the professional Kind of nature of our stuff we put in so much effort and they're the labels are really really super affordable so that is that all done all done it's nice to have a couple of things done this week i was feeling for a while they're quite um 
they are on Etsy, Kelly. Um, Sweet Pine Hill um, from Etsy. I think I have their card here. I keep it close by me. Sweet Pine Hills, Jerry and Megan, they are in Raymond, Alberta. They were lovely to work with because of course I wanted to do everything custom and uh, have it all look custom, all the labels and whatnot. And so I keep their uh, card close by and uh, they are on Etsy, Sweet Pine Hills. Um, you can also find them at sweetpinehills.com. So yeah. Jerry was great to deal with. He was the one that helped me design the labels. And if you go onto their website on um, Etsy, if I don't even, I, I'm sure they're still on Etsy. I haven't looked recently. Uh, but if you look, they have all different types of examples. And the nice thing about one of the things that they do, and I wish I had it close by, but I don't, is if you take the label, I don't think I have any of my mine close by. What I do on the brim of hats and shawls is I actually fold this label because it's folded. I fold it around the brim. So I actually fold it around here and that hides the cast on edge. And then you know where to put the toque either off to the side or at the back. Um, so right here, this is where I cast on. Um, this is where the cast on seam is. I would actually put the label over top here. So I don't generally bother doing it on toques for myself, but if I'm giving them as gifts or, um, then I, then I will. And actually I don't have a shawl right here where I've put it around, but I can share that with you guys. Yeah, she's okay with the let low pee, uh, Maggie. Um, you know, it's funny. I just don't say anything. <laughs> I'm like this is your sweater. I don't say anything about the itch factor or about the scratchiness or about the fact that the yarn might be a little bit coarse. I say nothing. I'm just like, here's your sweater. Try it on. Isn't this awesome? <laughs> um, James is very sensitive. He often will say stuff um, and he'll say, oh, it's to this, it's to that, blah, blah, blah. Um, but for the most part, he's actually really good. So I, back in the summer, I had cast on for Sorry Norland's Pro, uh, pattern called poet and I had gotten a little bit bogged down with it and had to put it aside for some other projects but a couple of people which will I'll share in community participation finished theirs uh, in the past couple of weeks and I was so inspired that I pulled it out especially now that I'm finishing some of these other projects and I've been working on it so I actually have gotten about five inches four inches four inches uh, into the body now from the underarm and um, I'm just kind of knitting away. So this is uh, Swan's Island um, Organic Merino. It's in the gold, goldfinch colorway. And I've got the, the chart here and I've just been kind of working my way up and unfortunately my sticky fell off. So I have no idea where I am in the chart anymore, but I'll figure it out. It's, it's pretty intuitive. And um, I just, um, I, I picked it back up again and I am working on it in the background. But I have been working on something else and I have all of a sudden been able to make some really great progress. You know how you get to that point with your projects where you're um, working away on stuff and you maybe have multiple cast ons, multiple things going on like spinning wise, couple projects on the looms and you're just feeling like you're not finishing anything and no matter what you do, nothing's fin getting finished and you're kind of trucking along on all these endless rows or endless yards of spinning and like nothing is getting finished. That was how I was feeling with everything. So getting a couple of things cast off this week really felt good because it just reinvigorated me. And um, I pulled out this week just to kind of give myself an opportunity to sort of look at where I was at. I pulled out my tunic cardigan. So this is um, a mosaic pattern that was in Vogue Knitting. I've talked about it quite a bit on the podcast. And, um, it's uh, mosaic knitting all the way from the cast on. It's worked from the bottom up. It's worked in pieces. So you do the back piece, you do the two side pieces, and then you sew them together. And, um, it's a seamed sweater. So I Frankensteined it and I, uh, am knitting it all together as one piece. And for those who haven't seen this before, because I haven't talked about it for a while, um, I will show you really quickly what this finished looks like. It's a vest. 
Um, so that is it there. Let me just take the glare off for you. That is it there. This is out of October 2007 Vogue Knitting. And there's that big chunk of rib across the waist. It's about four inches uh, long before you work until the underarms. So I actually, because of what happened last night and sort of the evening not going according to plan and them calling um, to ask us if we could delay picking up our groceries, I ended up at my mom's because um, Norris was staying the night, but I had to drop off Norris pajamas and everything. Um, she, I ended up staying at my mom's for about two hours waiting for them to call to say that the groceries were finally ready. Super frustrating, but they were really, um, uh, they were really nice about it. And, um, I could tell they were like super stressed. So I ended up getting all of that ribbing done last night. So let me just put on my, my cable extenders here so that I can spread this out a little bit. And I thought I would just show it to you on my Diana. Um, and then last night after I got home, Mike and I were in the middle of, there was a new Mandalorian yesterday, uh, that was released on Disney plus. So we wanted to watch it obviously. And so I did this little bit up here. And so this is that last little bit of mosaic that you work from here all the way up to your underarm. So I'll show this to you on my Diana. I am so in love with this. And I actually tried this on my Diana yesterday and, uh, I'm really happy with how it's working out thus far. Let me turn the cameras. There we go. And then I'll push her back so that, ah, so that you guys can see. Just give me one sec here to get myself organized. So this is meant to be worn with quite a bit of positive ease. And... Uh, Good trick when you're trying sweaters on, just knot your, knot your needles. And they stay put if you double knot them. Pull them pull them through each other twice, and then they stay. So I've got the Forester vest, Forager, the Forager vest on underneath um, this, under, underneath on my Diana right now, because I'm, I'm fitting it and finishing it. So there's quite a bit of bulk underneath. Um, but that is how this is going to fit. So this, this is my waist right here. Um, this is my waist. So this is going to go across the waist here. And then I'm going to work up to the underarm about the pattern calls for about five inches, just over five inches of, um, of knitting to the underarm, which is here on my Diana. So I've got sort of about probably one, maybe two chart repeats to work my way through. And then I'll be separating for the front and separating for the back. So, and then what you do at the end is all of this uh, uh, selvage edge gets picked up with, and you do about five inches of ribbing that comes out with um, buttons. So very, very, very effective. Not say that the back, isn't that cool? And there's a whole bunch of bulk under here. So just, um, recognize that it's being stretched over bulk. And one of the things, um, this is something to think about when you're figuring out about patterns and what, what is going to work on you and, and which size to ma make, look at the photo itself of how it looks on the person. Because if the pattern has a lot of ease, like let's say there's like 10 inches of positive ease, which is how this is photographed in the magazine. It's photographed on somebody who's incredibly petite on a sweater that's about a 40 inch bust across and there's about probably a good 10 to 12 inches of positive ease maybe even a bit more um and so you need to look at that because if that's the aesthetic that you like and that's what you're going for you need to do the same on your own body or you need to recognize that that particular fit or that way of knitting something or that way of making garments uh and that degree of ease positive negative or otherwise uh it doesn't work on your body um, you need to take that into account because the garment is going to look different on you than it will in the photo. So I often will take a pulse and take a moment to kind of figure out what is it that is attracting me to this look and to the photograph and what is it that's attracting me about this garment? Um, you know, is it the look, is it the clothing underneath or around? Is it the overall feel or is it the sweater itself? Um, and then I go from there because often 
there's stuff that I'm drawn to, but it's the feel of it or it's the look or the aesthetic. It's not really the sweater itself or that shape isn't one that really works well on me, but I like the, I like the photograph. So take a minute sometimes to figure that out. So that is the, one of the things that I really liked about the pattern photo was, was the ease and the fact that it just falls straight on her. So I made sure that I had enough ease through my hips that that would be the case, that I would be able to button it up and that I would be able to also wear it open. I have a long cardigan vest from H&M that I bought and it was when H&M had first come to Canada and I think I bought it in 2005 and um, it comes way, way down to my knees. It's really, really super long. And one of the things that I love about it is the drape and the ease and how big it is. And um, I still wear it, I still have it. And uh, I think that was one of the things that drew me to this pattern was the, the ease and how it just falls. So yeah, I'm super excited, excited to get this, get this going because once I get to the underarm and I divide for the back and the front, um, the knitting will go quite quickly because even though you're still working that mosaic, um, you're, uh, now you're just working on, on half the stitches. Um, across the back and then of course the front you're working on a quarter of the stitches so it'll just go a little bit quicker what I'm not looking forward to to be honest with you is the ribbing um, I think that's going to be very labor intensive the ribbing around the front uh, because you pick up your stitches all the way around and you're doing your ribbing for five inches uh, five inches wide and there's buttonholes in there as well so it's going to be a bit labor intensive but that's okay I'll get there there's no rush I'm just really excited about this project. I'm, I'm really loving it. Um, so that is that project. I'll just catch up with the chat. We need a fall finish along. Absolutely. That's what those Zoom meetings in December are going to be for. Um, that hour that we're going to spend together on Zoom. If you haven't seen the information about that, you need to check the newsletter. And the links and everything will be posted in uh, uh, in the Slack channel. Uh, totally Zen. Absolutely. So she says, holy cow, how long of a cable will that take to pick up? I am very thankful for my Addy Clicks right now because you notice that length of, I'll just pull it out. Um, you know that length of needle that I just put on to show you guys so that I can put it on Diana for you. So this, this length here. I'm probably going to have to do something like that where I, where I put my cable extender in. Um, this is a, this is the cable extender that comes with, uh, the Addy clicks and there's one that comes with the, um, Likey needles. And there's also one that comes with the Chow Goos. And I think I'm going to have to use a, a cable extender so that I can work my way around, not only for, um, picking up or for knitting, around that many stitches, but also just to be able to spread them out a little bit, to be able to see and make sure that it's even. Um, because sometimes if you're not really careful, you can uh, pick up um, in an uneven way and end up with different differing numbers of stitches. And you wanna make sure that your stitches that you're picking up really evenly. So. Okay, let me just put this away. Um, I have a spin to share with you that didn't make it into the uh, show notes this week. And um, it was because it got started sort of um, on a, not on a whim. I had been planning it for a while, but I um, was able to start it. I didn't think that I would be able to start it. And I was able to. I had a couple of minutes to sit quietly. And uh, I, I just was really thankful that I had a few moments and that I was able to get this spin onto the Saxony. So this is UK Shetland. This is from Small Bird Workshop. It was some stuff that she had sourced from a mill. And I'm doing it on my London Saxony double drive. This is the two ply plyback test up here. Um, I'm just using a continuous backwards. I'm kind of playing around with a little bit of long draw, but you can see those singles at the bottom, how uneven they are and airy. This is a humbug bump of fiber. And uh, right there in the center, that, that test there where the dark Shetland is, uh, is actually a three ply plyback test. 
And this is what the fiber looks like. Uh, I saved a, a length of it uh, so that I would be able to see it in the future. I haven't filed it away in my book yet, but um, that was sort of what I was what I was looking at. And this is the um, bump of fiber here. So it's this sort of carded up, all these different types of uh, colors of Shetland, most, mostly gray and black. Um, there is a little bit of white in there and a little bit of tawny brown, but for the most part, it's black and, and gray. And um, it's just creating this really, really toothy, like you can see how toothy that, I'll, I'll bring it up close, that three ply is. Um, it's got quite a bit of texture, it's airy. And if I spent the time during the spinning to pull all of that out, you would lose all of the black for one. Um, and you would lose some of that rustic nature of the yarn. It's quite, it's actually amazingly soft. When I started spinning it, however, um, it's on my fax me back here. Uh, it does have a little bit of lanolin left. It's got some grease in it. And even just squishing it here, I can feel it on my hands. And so when I'm drafting it, let me just move over a little bit here so I can show you. I'm going to shift just a tiny bit. Um, the when, I, when I'm working at it at the wheel, um, as, I'm, as I'm spinning, I'm sort of having to attenuate it a little bit. Sorry, I'm out of the frame. Um, I'm having to attenuate it just, just a little bit before I start to spin. And some of those neppy bits, some of that texture is actually just sort of naturally falling out um, because it's very difficult to sort of uh, draft through some of it. And I had started off with a long draw, but the problem is that some of this just absolutely won't draft. It's just um, all neppy and um, kind of doesn't, it just doesn't have a, a nice smooth feel to it and it just doesn't it doesn't come apart very nicely and so from that long draw I pivoted and went to the continuous backward but no smoothing so um, as I was as I was drafting um, I my hands weren't skipping like I wasn't opening my fingers but I wasn't smoothing I was just kind of running them back to the next to the next section to to draft so um, yeah really really kind of interesting fiber to work with um, very, very textured, very toothy. Um, it's not, it's not coarse. It's quite soft to the hand. And I think the finished yarn is going to be quite soft, but it is rustic. Uh, it's definitely got a very rustic feel. It will create a very rustic yarn and it will create a very rustic fabric. Um, and I think a lot of that is just all of that color in there and those neps and, um, yeah, just sort of the nature of the, of the fiber. It's, it's quite lovely. I think, I think any of the grease that's left in here, it just like the CVM mohair, it will it will definitely uh, definitely wash out. So I've been sitting quietly and just going through and pre-drafting a whole length of it, and then sitting down and spinning it. But you can see like there's some tips in there that have been left that never got opened up in the carding and washing process. So they're like kind of like second cuts, kind of. You can't even really see that see that on my fingers so there's that so just a really fun spin no plans just really enjoying it um old lanolin and fiber if it gets really crunchy eve um and it's got a really um um it's what happened to my cormo it heated and cooled in the in the garage and it was exposed to air and that lanolin got quite old um if that happens you the really the only thing you can do is try to give it a really good wash um, and try to get that lanolin out there or send it to a mill and see if they can deal with it and what I ended up doing was I sent it off to Liz at Kingdom and she fixed it up for me yeah it's super tricky to to um, draft and when it's in a bat it's really difficult to deal with um, this is why storing, how we store our wool and how we store our fleece is really important. Um, that um, Cormo really kind of reinforced that for me, that that I need to be a bit more aware of how I'm storing my fleece because it was all exposed to air. And if I had left it in an airtight sealed um, plastic bag and gotten all of, used like a big heavy duty Ziploc and gotten all of that air out of it and stored it properly, probably the crunchiness of the lanolin wouldn't have been quite as bad and I would have been able to wash it out yeah stickiness is is sort of the same it's from being exposed to the air I'm pretty sure uh, maybe somebody else can can um, um, chime in this is a bit sticky um, it's got that sticky nature to it and that'll wash out it's just not always very nice to spin 
Um, Zan, yes, the unicorn sweater already made an appearance, so hopefully you can go back after and rewatch. I wanted to share with you my tilted duster that I cast on on a complete and total whim, but it's actually just a little bit out of the frame. So if you don't mind, I will grab it and um, I can keep talking. This was something that I cast on on a complete and total whim. It was not planned. Um, I had found it in my stash um, and I had found it sort of cast on and partially knit. And I decided to give it a chance and to keep on knitting on it and just to see what would happen, uh, whether or not I, I liked it or not. Um, to be honest with you, I'm kind of, I'm kind of neutral. I'm sort of feeling a bit Switzerland about it. I'm not, I don't love it. I don't hate it. Um, I will say though, that this sweater has ended up being, um, I'm calling it the triple tilted duster, uh, because everything is taking three times to fix and to do. So I do something and then I have to rip it out and do it again three times. So this is an old Nora Gone pattern. Um, it, it was knit by everyone. Um, I feel like everybody except for me knit it. And I did try to knit it a couple of times, but no matter what I did, I just could not get it to work on me and on my body um, at that time. It just it just didn't, didn't work out. This is Cascade 220 from my stash. Um, one of the things that I really noticed with this sweater when, when everybody was knitting it back when, when it was released was that people knit it too small and then the front piece here didn't meet up properly and it was too much negative ease. And so what ended up happening was people were wearing it like this and it just, it didn't look very nice to be honest. Um, and so a lot of people, what they ended up doing was putting a little hook and eye right here. And I thought that that was really a lovely fix because it's invisible. Um, and you sort of hide that um, fit issue, especially across your bust, because as women, we all know that sometimes we're a little bit uh, bigger than at other times. And so especially throughout the month as we fluctuate. And so the um, um, so I thought that maybe that's what I would do is put a little hook and eye here if I after I finish it, if I feel like I need that. And then the other thing is the button band you work buttonholes on the inside as well so that you get that really tight fit but I'm actually thinking I might take that off because when it's worn open that doesn't look very nice um, I don't really like it particularly and I would like to be able to just wear this open sometimes like with the collar kind of flipped open like that like I think that's actually quite quite a quite a nice look and then it just kind of hangs so I'm going to take these off that's what I mean about this sweater being like three times the charm because I've already done the button band twice so I have to do it a third time until it's like really done so I'm going to take these off and I'm going to unpick and take these out um, and take these two uh, buttonholes out so that it'll just be a, a button band and then I thought the hook and I would sort of help to finish that off um, so that I'm also, the other thing that I had to do, uh, so this is knit in pieces as well. And so you're supposed to knit the front and then you knit the back and then you sew them together. So I did them all as one piece. Um, and my gauge was bang on with the pattern and I wanted it to be a little bit bigger and to give me a, a, a quite a bit of positive ease, sort of like five to six inches of positive ease so that it would fit across the front properly and be more like a jacket. Anyways, I did that and um, <clears throat> for whatever reason, it was absolutely massive. Um, it was so big that like the front came across to like, it was like coming across to like here. So even when I put it on, on my body, cause it fits a bit different on me than it does on the dress form. It just, there was no way. So I ripped it out, redid it and I ended up actually knitting it true to size. So I'm actually knitting the, whatever the size is that fits my actual bust. Um, so I think I ended up doing the 32 inch bust and it's still like on the dress form, it fits a little bit tighter than it does on my body. And, um, yeah, it's perfect. And then the skirt I had to do three times to get it started, picked up all the stitches around and, uh, let me just fix this so you guys can really see. So that's how it'll fall down the back. So you can see that it's quite, quite baggy. Um, there's lots of positive ease in there and, uh, 
I think from the underarm to the finish of the skirt, it's supposed to be about 22 or 23 inches. I think I'll do it more like 20 or 21 inches because it's just a bit too long for me. So um, that's uh, <clears throat> that's a tilted duster. It's an old pattern, one that everybody sort of knit like almost 10 years ago now. Um, and I just sort of am late to the to the party because I had I'd stashed it. I'd started it and, and, and left it. So this is uh, Cascade 220 in the straw colorway. Um, I didn't, I, it came that way, Zan, the uh, UK Shetland. It came that way. It's pin drafted roving. Um, so I could comb it. I could go through the entire thing and I could fix it um, and, and comb it and whatnot, but I don't think it's worth it. I'm just going to spin it as is and create a really soft, um, lofty, airy woolen yarn. And I think that'll be really quite perfect. So, yeah. Okay. Do not miss the hormone fluctuations. You're obviously through them, Zan. Could you stitch placeholder buttons over the holes on the inside? Um, you know what, Mars? That's not a bad idea. Would show as decorative as you, when you wear it open. That's not a bad idea. I might. Um, I also was thinking, cause it's right at the cast off edge, like, like as you're casting off, it's right at the end there. So ripping down those couple of that particular row, I would only have to tink back five cast off stitches and then go down, fix it and pull it all back up. So yeah, I would just cast them. Yeah. So, oh, what am I wearing? This is my, um, uh, Frankenstein sweater. Um, it is, I've been wearing it all week. This is Vermont. At the back, the, the lace pattern is Vermont. I've shown this sweater on the podcast before, and then I used, I plugged the lace pattern from Vermont into the featherweight by Hannah Fettig. Um, I did my own gauge. It was, um, oh my goodness, I think it was, um, I knit it on five millimeter needles, 4.5 millimeter needles. I knit it one year when we weren't camping. I'd finished the spinning and um, I call this my hand spun mammoth. I'll link it for you guys in the show notes here or in the, in the live chat. I knit it, the body of the cardigan was on 4.5 millimeter needles and the ribbing was all done on four millimeter needles. Um, and this was some hand carded Falkland from West Coast Color. Um, Lynn had gotten, had bought a bunch of it. She doesn't carry it anymore because it's all, it's very neppy. Um, it's just full of neps and noils and whatnot. And so I didn't know any better at the time. I spun it all long draw, made it, made a three ply. This is all three ply wool. And um, over the years, the neps and noils and the pills and everything are, they'll fall out. And what'll end up happening is I'll be left with a just really great, heathered textured sweater. I love the color. And uh, I actually, I, for a long time, I didn't wear it very often. <clears throat> and I kind of forgot that it was in my closet. And then I pulled it out and I started wearing it. And now I wear it all the time. And I think part of it is it's long. I can throw it with any kind of a t-shirt. Um, and it, for the most part, sits okay. And actually yesterday, before it started raining, I had to throw a rain jacket on over top. Um, but yesterday, this was my outfit. Um, I wore this. This is a shawl, hand spun shawl that I did from my friend Chrissy, Snappy Stitches. Um, from her, I think it's the Brookdale shawl. And this was um, Elfin Wool. This is Tina's, uh, Tina's comb top. Yeah, and this is what I wore yesterday. Easy peasy. And you look put together, and it's soft, and you're warm. <laughs> It's all the, all the best things. So those are all of my projects. So let's go into community participation. Um, for November, uh, the, yeah, the Tweety yarn, I'll chat with you about the Tweety yarn, um, Eve, cause it was a roving that, that Lynn, um, had, had made, um, at a mill that it didn't turn out the way that she had really hoped. And it had a huge amount it, it, that what created the tweed was all of the naps that had been accidentally in, caused in the carding process. So this is not how you would normally make a tweed yarn. Um, and it's Falkland. And, um, unfortunately it just, um, the roving was sort of, sort of ruined. Um, and so I didn't know any better at the time. And I just spun it up thinking that it was just the way that it was supposed to be. Um, but she, um, 
uh, talked to me about it later and said like, you know, it's, it was sort of a mill mill mix up. So it's kind of too bad that all of that Falkland sort of got wrecked. Um, cause it's hard to spin through all of those naps and oils and stuff. And I did that on my shack sidekick and I just, you know, you, you don't know what you don't know, right? All that texture. That's part of the reason why I'm happy to spin through stuff like this that has some of that texture in there, because I know the potential of what can happen with that fiber. I know that this is not, you know, mortally damaged, that it'll just give me a really textured yarn. Um, and will create, um, a really, um, sort of textured woolen yarn. And if I spin fine singles and I do a three ply, it'll give you that roundness and some of that texture and some of that stuff that's in there will kind of get eaten up into the yarn, like into the core of the yarn. And, um, it'll create a structurally sound yarn and some of it will pill and some of it will work its way out over time, but like, that's okay. So for community participation for November, tell us about your favorite items that you've made, yarn, garment, fiber, weaving, um, based on an emotion or a feeling, uh, or maybe about a project that you worked on through an emotion or a feeling, something that you felt really frustrated about or happy or joyful. Um, so you can comment in the episode thread on Ravelry if you use Ravelry, which I'm linking in the live chat, or you can comment below on YouTube and I'll correlate all of the comments from YouTube and from Ravelry to draw a winner next month, next week, because next month is next week. <laughs> We're already into December. I just can't believe it. Um, we have bonus content for how I spin this month that is available for everybody to watch, whether you're a patron of the community or not. So please enjoy that. I have linked it below. And me and Rebecca got together for a bonus episode of Woolen Spinning Radio this month, and you can have a listen to that. I will link that as well in the live chat. And so those three links are there for you guys, for patrons, for the Woolen Spinning Radio. And then anybody can participate in our, give, uh, our giveaway this month and the How I Spin for this month. It was a bonus How I Spin that I did about our Char Rolet, about our um, uh, Breed and Color study. So let's talk about some hand spun knitting. So this is not hand spun knitting. This is from, oh, hang on. Let me just fix something. Sorry, Maggie. <laughs> I have to take you out. <laughs> you were last week. Um, so the first thing I wanted to share with you was the Make Nine progress. So I had mentioned about the Poet sweater. So Poet was on my Make Nine for 2020, but on my second Make Nine. And I didn't really get anything off of my second Make Nine done. I had made two because at the beginning of the year, there was so much stuff going on that I had sort of ended up with a list of, of sweaters that I wanted to make. And they kind of made up two different grids. The first grid, except for one sweater, which I have cast on, I finished. I'd made all eight of my nine sweaters. Uh, and I have the ninth one on the needle. So I feel like that's pretty good. Uh, but Lizzie she finished her poet sweater. So she finished her poet sweater. She really likes the final product. She had the magazine and was thinking about knitting it for a while, but finally got the inspiration to get started when I started making mine. While not hand spun, she used Cumbria from the Fiber Co. And it is a mix of brown mass and merino and mohair. And actually we will be talking about Cumbria next month in How I Spin. Beautiful sweater, Lizzie. I think she just did a gorgeous job. It really suits her and I love the length of it. Um, she didn't knit it too short or too long. It just looks perfect with her jeans where it hits on her hips and uh, with her hands sort of tucked into her pockets there. I think it just looks fantastic. So really beautiful job, Lizzie. Uh, and then as a sort of um, second one, this is why I pulled out my poet this week, you guys. Uh, it's you. I might inspire you, but you guys inspire me a hundredfold. This is from Maria. This is her finished poet. So now I feel really sheepish because other people have finished theirs and I haven't finished mine. I made my myself a poet sweater too with the same inspiration. I used a sustainable merino yarn that she dyed herself with certain mushrooms and green carrots. I think that is so cool. The greens of carrots. She used the magazine version of the pattern as well. And she took a copy of the charts and drew the lines of increases with a pen. So it was easier to follow. I've heard uh, Lizzie mention this as well. I know that the pattern out of the magazine is really difficult to follow. The um, printed pattern, because I didn't have the magazine. So I bought the pattern from Sorry on Ravelry. It's perfect. It's an excellent pattern. So if you're having difficulty with the magazine version of the pattern, definitely get yourself the... Um, the printed version from, from Ravelry, the PDF. Uh, there was errata in her size on the other side of the chart. She made the sleeves a hint wider and the neck ribbing a bit less 
with a bit less stitches. The lace got easier during the process. It is not difficult. I totally agree, Maria. And you get the hang of it as you work your way through the sweater because it becomes more and more intuitive. Um, she should have altered the skeins, but she alternated the skeins, but she did not. It doesn't look like there's any striping in the sweater. Um, it's always a great idea to alternate skeins when you're dyeing, um, when you're working with hand dyed yarn. But um, I think Maria did a great job here and it doesn't show that there's different skeins, uh, at least from the photos. There are small differences in the shades, a bit of a dull pick, but there is a little light, daylight today. Gorgeous, beautiful. You guys are totally inspiring me to get going on mine. Zero to Hero. Zero to Hero is an opportunity for us to go from fiber to spinning to finished item, whether it's a garment or a woven piece, whatever. Um, this is from Jackie. This is just gorgeous. She finished a sweater recently that we shared on the podcast. And this shawl rivals that. I think it's just absolutely beautiful, Jackie. She has three skeins of a Targi spin, part of which went into her Birdsong sweater, which we talked about recently as well to create the Festival of Stitches shawl. I actually would love to see this shawl done in um, Christmas colors. I think it would be really pretty with the white and maybe a blue and a gold or maybe um, a green and a cranberry red or something. I think it would be really beautiful. Uh, it is such a clever design. You start with the triangle shape and then work each side on the bias. The textures include garter, lace, cables, and mosaic. It's beautiful. So you start with that, that uh, triangle at the back and you work that first and then you work out to finish the rest of the shawl. It's very clever, very clever. Now this is from Arusa Lee. This is her finished yarn for Zero to Hero. She's slowly making progress on her sweater spin. So she's not quite done yet. She's just finished skein two. Um, the two, the last pic shows the two skeins together and she started spinning in July of last year. So the sweater spin seems nuts, but she's going for it. And this is a fractal. Beautiful spinning. I love these colors. I had to show them because I just love the colors. <laughs> so inspiring, you guys. So inspiring. So our last community participation for today is from Rebecca. This is community. All of her yarns for the 51 yarns uh, that was from the community part of the book. So she's been sitting on these posts and these yarns for a while because it's difficult to commit herself to emotional posts, but she's finally, she's glad that she finally did. So yarn number 46 was spinning at a retreat. This is the yarn that she spun from my battlings when she was here, uh, when she was in Vancouver. And that was the orangey colored yarn that just scrolled by. Number 47 was spinning with a group. This is some Kiviet that she spun with and from her friend Alid, uh, who she's been spinning with almost weekly for a good year now. Not meeting right now, obviously, but still enjoying so much inspiration from each other. So this is the um, Batlings. This is the Kiviet. And then the final yarn, number 48, teaching someone to spin. She gave her seven-year-old a spinning lesson back in March. I think we are overdue for another one, though. We also have weaving and cross-stitch to go on to go on to right now. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing. So thank you everyone for being here this week. Thank you so much for allowing me to wax poetic for over an hour about everything that I'm working on and all the things that you guys have going on in your lives as well. That's why I love community participation so much. I just really appreciate that time to be able to sit and uh, share what you guys are doing. If anybody has any last minute questions, please pop into the chat and ask them now. And uh, I just hope you guys are sort of, you know, hanging in there and, and enjoying, uh, the some of the festivities that are starting up I know here people are putting up their Christmas trees they're putting up their Christmas lights um, they're kind of getting ready a little bit early and uh, I know it's American Thanksgiving for you guys Black Friday was yesterday so I hope that you guys are having a restful time and enjoying spending that time together in your home units at you know sort of you know with with your immediate household I was going to mention something and now I'm forgetting what it was um, for December, we've got two Zoom craft alongs for the Patreon community that you guys can um, jump in on. Those links will be posted in Patreon for um, the for you. Uh, I'll send out just a private message. That will be for the. Let me just double check. That will be for everybody in the. Basically, anyone that's above the coffee circle. So from the coffee circle and up. 
um, you guys will be getting a Zoom link. There are going to be two in December. Everybody's invited. And we'll just kind of manage the Zoom meeting by um, keeping everybody on mute. And then um, we'll do a check-in and kind of go around and everybody can can share a bit about themselves and uh, just sort of share with us what you're what you're working on and, and just do kind of a bit of a check-in. Um, it'll be a plan for about an hour. Um, other than that, I hope everybody's doing really super well. I hope that you guys are, are crafting and making lots and getting onto your wheels and having that quiet time. And um, until next time, happy spinning, happy knitting, and wash your hands and wear a mask. And I will chat with you guys next week. Thank you so much for being here. Bye, everyone. Mm -hmm.